Hello, welcome to Fast Books. In this video, we are going to start reading a high fantasy novel written by American writer Robert Jordan, the first book of the Wheel of Time series. The Eye of the World consists of one prologue and 53 chapters. Spoilers ahead, let's get started. Prologue Dragon Mound Luz Thurin Telemann wanders through his nearly destroyed palace, looking for his wife Elena Thurin Moerl. Dead men, women, and children lie everywhere, but the taint on Sadan has driven Luz Thurin insane and he does not notice his surroundings. Ishmael appears, having traveled there, and approaches Luz Thurin saying I have come for you. Luz Thurin does not recognize him and Ishmael realizes he is mad. Ishmael identifies himself as having once been Elin Morin Tedrani, and Luzthorin manages to recognize him as betrayer of hope Luzthorin of his madness, who screams in pain. As the pain recedes, Luzthorin comes to his senses. He sees Elina's body and is consumed with sorrow. Ishmael says that the great lord of the dark can bring her back, and Luzthorin turns to him with murderous intent. He says he will have revenge for Alina's death, but Ishmael asks him to cast his mind back, to remember the Dark One's counterstroke against Satan. Ishmael says the hundred companions are tearing the world apart, and more men join them every day. He tells Luzthorin to remember who it was who killed all of his friends and family. Luzthorin remembers the deeds, and howls in torment as he looks at his surroundings. Unable to bear his shame, he travels to a flat, empty land beside a river. He can feel the taint on Satan, and cries out for forgiveness as he channels more and more. A bolt of fire comes down from the sky, burning through him and the earth below him, sending lava spouting upwards to form a mountain. The river has been redirected in an arc around the mountain, with an island in the middle. Ishmael appears on the island, and vows that all is not yet over between him and the dragon. Chapter 1, An Empty Road Rand Althor and his father Tam Althor are traveling in the Westwood via the quarry road to Immens Field. Their mare Bila is hauling a cart with casks of apple brandy and cider which Tam has promised to the wine spring in for the Beltine celebrations the next day. With the winter being so hard and long, wolves and bears had been attacking people and animals, so both Rand and Tam are watchful of their surroundings. Rand looks behind them and sees a mire drail on a black horse following. Rand stumbles, breaking his stare with the fade, and tells Tam there is a stranger following them. They stop, look behind them, but the mire drail is not there. Rand wonders if it was a figment of his imagination, and they continue on. They enter Emmons Field, where they are stopped by Whit Conger. He starts complaining about a new wisdom, Nine Me Valmira, until his wife, Days Conger, arrives and starts admonishing Wit. Rand and Tam quickly continue to the wine spring inn. As they walk through the village, they see Beltine preparations going on everywhere. Reaching the wine spring inn, Brandil Winalvir, the owner of the inn and the mayor of Emmons Field, comes out to greet them. He and Tam are chatting about the odd winter when Sanbui arrives to add his negative comments on the matter. As the conversation continues, Matrim Cawthon, hidden from their view, tugs on Rand's sleeve. He tells Rand that he and Dab Allen have caught a badger that they are going to let loose on the green to watch the girls scream. Rand says he has to help carry the casks and barrels into the inn. Matt mentions strangers in the village, and Rand describes the mired rail. Matt admits he saw one three days before, and how scared he was with it just staring at him. Matt's father Abel Cawthon also didn't believe there was anything there, though Matt thinks people would have to believe him now with Rand backing what he saw. Matt is seen by Tam, and is recruited as another helping hand for getting the casks inside. Tam tells them there is a gleeman in the inn, and Bran recalls how the man had arrived in the middle of the night. Sen then lets slip that there will be fireworks as well. When Bran confronts him about his loose tongue, Sen quickly ducks into the inn. Tam states they need to unload the cart, and the rest begin carrying casks into the inn. Chapter 2, Strangers Rand and Matt unload the first barrels and enter the common room of the inn, to find not only Tam and Bran, but Sanbui and Haralu in present. 
Master Luan frowns at Matt. Mistress Alvir brings out some food, and says the boys can get something to eat in the kitchen when they're done. In the cellar, Matt tells Rand that Master Luan is mad at him, and explains that he played a prank on Aiden Alcar, Yuan Finger, and Dag Coplin using two of Master Luan's dogs, and his joke ended up getting flour all over the Luan house. When they pass back through the common room to continue unloading, Rowan Hearn and Samuel Craw have arrived, and Tam is speaking quietly and intently to the now complete village council. They unload the rest of the barrels while eating honey cakes. Just as Matt is about to tell Rand about the Gleeman, Yuan Finger arrives and says there are strangers in the village, not a man in black, but a woman in blue and a man in a cloak that shifts colors. Matt says that they were the ones he'd started to tell Rand about earlier they'd arrived the evening before and taken rooms at the inn. Yuan interjects that their names are Moirain and Lan. Yuan says that Nynaeve doesn't like Moirain, because she called Nynaeve child. Moirain has been asking questions about how old people are, and how long they've lived where they have. Matt again mentions the Gleeman and Yuan is skeptical. They go back through the common room, where the village council is still huddled together talking quietly, and on outside. Matt asks Rand to back up his story about the Dark Rider, but he suddenly gets the feeling he's being watched. He looks around, but only sees a raven sitting on the inn roof. Matt and Rand, both angry at the bird staring at them, throw rocks, but the raven dodges, to their surprise. A woman's voice from behind them describes the raven as a vile bird, and it flies away. The boys turn to see a woman who can only be Moiraine. She looks like nobody Rand has ever seen, and he can't pin down her age. He notices the great serpent ring on her hand. They greet her as Lady Moiraine, but she tells them to just call her Moiraine. She says she may have some small tasks to be done while she is in Immens Field, asking the boys if they might be willing to assist her. Moiraine gives each of the boys a silver penny in return for their promise. She says that later they must tell her all about them. Rand asks why she came to Immens Field and she says she is a collector of old stories. They wonder aloud what stories there might be in the two rivers, but she says that men wear different faces as the wheel of time turns, and nobody can see the whole pattern. The boys are tongue-tied she says they will talk later, and walks away. As she does, a man who had been standing unnoticed nearby now moves to follow her. The tall man in the color-shifting cloak gives each of the boys an appraising look as he walks past. Yuan says that is Lan, and that he's probably a warder. Matt scoffs, saying that warders have jeweled armor and fight trollocs in the Great Blight. With the strangers gone, they finally look at their coins Yuan is ecstatic to find his is a whole silver penny. Rand and Matt have been given a silver coin also but theirs is different it is fat and bears the image of a woman balancing a flame on her upturned hand. The coins are worth more than the boys have ever had before, enough to buy a good horse, Rand thinks, but they resolve not to spend them. Hearing shouts, they look up to see a crowd of villagers accompanying the peddler's wagon towards the wagon bridge. Chapter 3, The Peddler The peddler's wagon crosses the wagon bridge and stops by the wine spring inn. The members of the village council emerge from the inn and wait with the crowd while the peddler, paid in vain, busies himself with his wagon. Rand and Matt push through the crowd to stand close behind the men of the council, and are soon joined by their friend Perrin Bara. After tantalizing the gathered crowd for a sufficient amount of time, Fane finally gets up to speak. He states that though the people of Emmons Field may feel they've lived through a harsh winter, the rest of the world has had as bad if not worse. He tells of war rising in Gilgan, with a man claiming to be the dragon reborn at its heart. The crowd cries out at this, the third occurrence of a false dragon in five years, and Sanbui crankily wonders if this truly is a false dragon. Fane can't speak to that, but does say that the man can wield the one power. Yuan Fenger points out that only women can safely touch the true source and nearly gets a cuff from Bui as a reward. Fane then says that Aes Sedai have already been dispatched from Tarvalon to attempt to capture the man. 
The mayor then asks the peddler to go inside the inn so that the village council can ask additional questions in private. After the peddler and the council disappear into the inn, the crowd slowly disperses with the exception of a few of the younger folk, Rand, Matt, and Baron ponder the news. Matt says he heard a story from a merchant's guard that the dragon would be reborn in mankind's greatest hour of need, but Rand and Perrin are skeptical. Just as the trio are finishing a discussion about whether all eyes said I are dark friends, Nine Eve Almira, the village wisdom comes by and reprimands Matt for his loose talk about Billy Conger. Eventually, Rand notices that Egwene Alvir arrived just behind Nine Eve. After telling Rand to quit staring at Egwene, Nynaeve asks why the group had been talking about something they should not have been, and Rand relays Peyton Fane's news. Stating that only the women's circle will find out anything useful from Fane, the wisdom leaves the group and enters the inn. Rand and Egwene get a chance to talk alone, and Rand asks her if she'll dance with him on Beltine. She says she will in the afternoon, but she will be busy in the morning. She's been permitted to braid her hair for the first time, meaning she is of marriageable age, dancing the pole. When Rand marks this change, he objects that not everyone of age to marry should. The two get in a bit of a tiff when Rand laughs at Egwene's comment that she might become a wisdom. Many villages want a wisdom that is not from their own town, and Egwene wants to see the places found in stories. At this point, Matt and Perrin come over and say that Perrin has also seen the Black Rider. Egwene, overhearing, claims none of the three should be off leading strings, not believing any of them. The growing argument is interrupted by the appearance of a man with shaggy white hair. Chapter 4, The Gleeman Tundral Marilyn, the Gleeman, emerges from the Wine Spring Inn and entertains Rand, Matt, Perrin, Egwene, and Ewan, as well as many other villagers. The performance is interrupted, however, by the arrival of Moiraine and Lan. There is tension between the Gleeman and the visiting lady, but he assures her all of his stories will be pleasing. After a while, Nynaeve and the village council emerge from their questioning of Peyton Fane. Tam informs Ran that they will be returning to their farm that night. On the way, Tam reveals that several other village boys have spotted the strange rider, and that a watch is being mounted. Chapter 5, Winter Night Rand and Tam return to their farm and do chores until time for dinner. Tam locks the doors of the house, even though no one in the two rivers ever does such a thing, saying it's best to be safe. While dinner is cooking, he goes upstairs and retrieves a sword from an old chest under his bed. Rand is surprised he has never seen the sword, and decides to ask more questions over dinner. As dinner is being served, Trollocs burst into the farmhouse. Rand flees through a side window as Tam holds them off, killing three. The two men regroup in the woods, where Rand finds that his father has been wounded and is suffering from a high fever. He returns to the farmhouse to collect supplies. After entering, Rand meets a Trolloc named Narg who asks him to put his sword down and says a Myrdrail will be coming and will want to speak with him. When Rand lowers his sword, Narg tries to rush him. Standing his ground, Rand manages to raise the sword in time and kills the beast, mostly by accident. After collecting needed supplies from the house, he goes to the barn to get Bela and the cart, but finds the horse and milk cow are missing and the cart mostly destroyed. Wondering how he is going to carry Tam back to Iman's field, he realizes timbers from the cart could be used for a litter. After using Tam's sword to cut the hardwood and finding the blade miraculously unaffected. Chapter 6, The Westwood Rand drags Tam towards Emmons Field on a litter in the woods along the quarry road. At one point he has to hide from a party of 20 Trollocs led by a Myrdrail. During the journey, Tam talks feverishly, reliving old battles and finding Rand during the blood snow. He talks about Carrie Althor, Rand's mother who died 15 years ago. He raves about the Aeol War and Layman Sin, the field at Merot and Carrion burning. Rand heads through the woods toward the village. While the Fade and its group pass by, Rand can feel the evil emanating from the dark creature. Tam cries out more about Avindoroldra, 
the cutting of a Venza Ura that grew for 500 years before King Laman cut it down. In some stories, a Venza Ura belongs to the Green Man. Tam also shouts about how pleased Kerry will be that he found Rand on Dragon Mount. Chapter 7, Out of the Woods Rand arrives at Emmons Field to find that it has also been attacked by Trollocs. He is met by Master Luan, who flags down Egwene. They follow her to Nynaeve, who inspects Tam and concludes that she can do nothing for him. Egwene gives Rand an emotional embrace, then rushes back to continue helping Nynaeve. Rand goes to the Wine Spring Inn in search of the mayor, Brandil Winalvir, hoping he will know how to help Tam. He finds Tom Marilyn outside the inn and the two of them carry Tam inside. There is a dragon's fang on the inn door. Bran Alvir sends the Gleeman running to fetch Nynaeve to care for Tam before Rand can tell them she's already seen him. After Tom leaves, Rand and Bran find a bed for Tam in one of the inn's vacant rooms. Rand is in denial after learning that Tam found him and is not really his father. Tom returns after nearly having his head removed by the wrath of the village wisdom and steers the conversation to Moiraine. The mayor says that the village would have been utterly destroyed if not for her help, revealing that she and Lang had sounded the first warning of the impending attack. In the battle she called ball lightning from the sky, making it obvious that she is Eyes Sedai and Lan is her warder. Bran reminds Rand of the stories that Eyes Sedai can heal, so Rand goes to find Moiraine. He swears he will pay any price in his power if she will heal Tam. Moiraine questions Rand about his dreams and asks him to let her know if he has nightmares. Lan begins calling Rand Sheferder, Chapter 8, A Place of Safety. When Rand, Moiraine, and Lan arrive at the room where Tam lies, Tom Marilyn and Bran Alvir are watching over him. Tom stalks out right away, and Lan announces that he does not trust the Gleeman, who was nowhere to be seen that night. Moiraine asks everyone to leave but Rand asks to stay and she allows it. Rand and Lan sit against the wall, and Moiraine asks not to be disturbed. Rand watches her, realizing she must be channeling the One Power. Lan asks him about Tam's sword. Rand says it is his father's, and Lan says it is an odd blade for a sheferder. Rand asks Lan if it would have helped them to know earlier about the man in the black cloak he'd seen. Moiraine says that she would have needed to bring a half dozen of her sisters to deal with the Trollocs and Myrdrail that were in the two rivers. She goes on to say that the raven she saw the previous day should have clued her in, regardless, so it is not Rand's fault. Lan explains that carrion eaters such as ravens, crows, and sometimes rats in cities can be minions of the Dark One. Rand looks at his father, and asks if Moiraine is finished yet. She says that she has soothed his pain, but the Trolloc weapon has left a taint which is difficult to heal. She takes out her robed woman Angriel, and begins healing Tam again. Lan tells Rand that the Dark Rider was a Myrdrail, and tells him more about them. Rand tells Alan how he talked to one Trolloc, startling the warder, before killing it. Lan congratulates him, as does Moiraine who rises unsteadily from Tam's bedside. Moiraine says he will be fine, as long as he has a few weeks of bed rest. Moiraine says offhandedly that Rand will doubtless be leaving at the same time she and Lan are. Rand is surprised, and babbles about how nobody ever really leaves the two rivers. Moiraine says that Rand himself will have to leave for the sake of his village. Most of the village was not attacked, except to sow confusion. The exceptions were Abel Cawthon's house. Errol Lewin's house and forge, as well as Tam's farm and the Barra farm outside of the village. The Trollocs were after Matt and Perrin as well as Rand, because they were looking for someone who was born near a certain time, and all three boys are within weeks of the same age. Rand says that there must be some mistake. Lan points out that it took a lot of effort to get so many Trollocs to the two rivers without them being noticed, and Moiraine says that they will likely be back unless their targets leave. She says that only in Tar Valon would they really be safe. Rand is reluctant to go so far, and to be with so many eyes said I. He asks if he can wait until his father wakes up, but Moiraine says that they should leave as soon as they can after dark, 
and she will fetch the other two boys. Rand stays with his father, and Master Alvir and his wife come back. Mistress Alvir gives him something to eat, and says he needs sleep. The two of them confirm Lan's information on which houses and farms were attacked. Rand thinks about Tam's sword and how his father must have been outside the two rivers to get it. After the Alvirers leave, Rand sits beside Tam, vowing to stay awake until his father wakes up. Chapter 9, Tellings of the Wheel Rand dreams that he is running across barren hills, under a blood-red sun. He can hear Trollocs on his trail, though he cannot see them. He scrambles to the top of a ridge and finds himself on the edge of a sheer cliff. In the middle of the Great Valley, there is a single tall, dead black mountain. He feels unseen hands trying to pull him towards the mountain, but he fights them. He hears a voice in his head, saying serve me, and he shouts out in defiance to Shaitan, then turns and scrambles away. Suddenly he finds himself in a different place, on a rolling plain covered with winter dead vegetation. There is another mountain, broken peaked, joyfully he moves towards the city, then begins to flee from the cold presence he can feel behind him. The city begins to recede as he draws closer, though his pursuer's fingers touch him, then he trips and falls. He lands on paving stones, near one of the bridges to the city. Smiling people speaking an unknown tongue pass him, beckoning him into the city. The city is filled with wondrous things, but ahead he sees the white tower that is his destination. When he tries to take a detour, though, he finds the tower ahead of him every way he turns. The people urge him desperately towards the tower. He walks towards it children throw flowers at his feet, and voices are raised in song. He reaches a palace at the base of the tower, and inside a myrdrail says it has been waiting for him. Rand awakens suddenly from these nightmares to find he's slept most of the day away by Tam's bedside. The fire has been tended while he slept, and the cool dinner has been replaced with warm food, indicating Mistress Alvir's persistent hand at work. As Rand begins eating ravenously, Tam wakes up. Rand tells his father of the recent events since the Trolloc attack on their farm and that the Eyes Sedai claims that Ran must leave Emmons Field since the invaders were searching for him or one of his friends. Tam doubts Moiraine's story, and asks Ran to repeat it word for word as much as he can remember, because while Eyes Sedai cannot lie they can twist their words. Lan knocks on the door, advising Ran to say his goodbyes quickly, because there may be trouble. Ran begins to unbuckle the sword belt but Tam advises him to keep it as he may have more use for it. They exchange a hug, and Lan drags Rand out. Matt is waiting outside the room with his bow, and the two of them hurry down the stairs after Lan. Downstairs a crowd of villagers, led by Hari Coplin and his brother Darl, have gathered outside the inn to attempt to run Moiraine and Lan out of the village, blaming them for the arrival of the Trollocs. When Hari threatens to burn them out, Errol Lewin and Bran Alvir manage to shame most of the crowd to silence by pointing out the lives and limbs that Moiraine and Lan saved during and after the attack. Moiraine gets the crowd's full attention by twirling her staff and making it spout flame from both ends. She laments that this is what Emmons blood has come to, that they have forgotten where they came from. She then tells them a story about the great city of Man Otherin and how it was destroyed during the Trolloc Wars. Man Etheran never rose again, and its memory was all but lost, but its descendants continued to live in the two rivers. After Moiraine's tale, some of the villagers come forward and say that Moiraine can stay if she wishes, and the others slink off in shame. As they leave, Lan pulls Rand and Matt around the back of the inn, towards the stables. Thanks for watching part 1. Click here for part 2. For more fantasy book videos, don't forget to leave a like write down a comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.